Now, as there are better times than others in your sphere of activity for sending rockets or spaceships to the moon, so there are peak periods when the self and the soul or entity coincide, when communication is at its best. All of this happens through the window of your present. In terms of energy, again, the vitality of your entity impinging into three-dimensional reality forms a particle that is your present being. But this particle is also deflected away from the Earth in a rhythmic pattern. The same happens to other portions of yourself at other points in the space-time continuum. But at certain intervals, you meet, so to speak. Each of your quote-unquote presence becomes charged, filled with potentiality, and your entity, its self-conscious energy, is also enriched by your various experiences, by the combined and magnified power of its own quote-unquote past. Apexes are therefore formed within each self. These apexes serve as attractions, now opened, through which the magnified potency of the entity can flow. This may appear as erratic energy, however, an analogy being sunspots. Psychologically, great ferment occurs, and often the individual personalities involved organize themselves along new lines. Privately, this is when human beings find themselves aware of greater illumination, when they make sudden decisions and experience new strengths. Now, such a time is in the offing socially. This may be reflected in periods of seeming unrest, in which, however, new creativity is looming. There will then be great planetary changes in terms of your organizations, but these will reflect private interior illuminations that become physically materialized. You do not trust your inner selves enough, or realize the creative ferment brewing. If you did, you could save yourselves much trouble. Any point in your present is a potential point of great creative change, but because of the rhythms spoken of, it is easier for changes to occur in certain cycles. Because the point of power and action is in your present as you understand it, so each day is like the kind of window that can provide many views through its different panes. The window of each day can be opened or closed, but it is framed by your current psychological experience. Even when it is shut, light shines through it, illuminating your daily life. In miniature form, each day contains, in its own way, clues to all of your own simultaneous existences. The present self does not exist in isolation. Within any given 24-hour period, then, traces and aspects of all of your other experiences appear in their own way. You each contain aspects of your other identities within your current selves, some very obvious, perhaps, and others barely noticeable. Abilities focused upon in one life may be recognized as your own now, for example, but not strongly utilized. Vague yearnings towards certain accomplishments may be clues that the necessary characteristics are inherent but untrained in the self that you know. In its own way, the 24-hour period represents both an entire lifetime and many lives in one. In it, symbolically, you have quote-unquote death as your physically attuned consciousness comes to the end of the amount of stimuli it can comfortably handle without rest. So, at your normal physical death, you come to the point where your earth-attuned consciousness can no longer handle further data without a quote-unquote longer rest and organize it into a creative, meaningful whole in terms of time. Each day, therefore, is an incarnation, so to speak, but not only symbolically, for through soul's intersection with the flesh, each self mirrors daily its quote-unquote reincarnational or simultaneous selves. The same applies on what you may think of as a more practical level, in that each day also holds within it the answers to current problems. If you are aware of a particular problem or challenge, therefore you can be assured that its solution is as much there and with you as the problem is. The solution is simply the problem's other side, upon which you may not be focusing. There will even be clear clues as to the proper direction for you to take. These will already be within your experience, but unrecognized because you are concentrating so upon the problem. This applies to any kind of dilemma. Although you are an individual and with free will, you are also part of another you. You simply do not identify with your greater self now. You have your own unique characteristics. Your greater being also possesses its own originality. 
yet there will be what you may think of as a family resemblance. And so overall, you and your other self often choose the same kinds of challenges, if in dissimilar ways. In their own ways, other portions of your multidimensional being are involved in experiences then somewhat similar to your own, though on the outside, the situation may be completely different. Their progress lies latent within the window of the present moment, the moment point simply being your current intersection with the reality that you know. The adventures of your simultaneous selves, again, appear as traces in your own consciousness, as ideas or daydreams or disconnected images, or sometimes even in sudden intuitions. They can be drawn upon, drawn out, to help you understand current problems. Now, this does not mean that you will necessarily have a flood of reincarnational information, instant intuitive recognition of quote-unquote past lives, or experiences of any such intrusive data. It does mean that in your own life, such information automatically appears in intimate ways, but couched within the framework of your own comprehensions, even passing unobtrusively through your conscious thoughts. Many artists unknowingly paint portraits of their simultaneous selves. Many mothers find themselves feeling younger than their offspring at times, or about to call some of their children by different names. Impulses to try activities that you have not tried before may indeed be messages from other portions of your own being. There simply is no time as you think of it, only a present in which all things occur. There are miracles of condensed information within the cells themselves that scientists cannot perceive, for they exist outside of the scope of physical instruments. In their own way, cellular comprehension includes a vast recognition of probabilities in your terms, and works with flashing manipulations in which these probabilities are contended with and responded to, and therefore altered. The physically attuned conscious mind, in your now, cannot handle these staggering probabilities while maintaining its sense of identity, yet there are conscious traces within your daily thoughts that are the psychological representations of such knowledge. Often, you do not trust your imagination, considering that it deals with phenomena that cannot be considered fact, Therefore, you artificially form a situation in which overall traces must be made. If you are too imaginative, for example, you may not be able to adequately deal with physical life. This applies only in the cultural media in which you presently operate, however. Originally, and in your terms of time, it was precisely the imagination that in its own way sets you apart from other creatures, enabling you to form realities in your mind that you could, quote-unquote, later exteriorize. Because you now distrust the imagination so, you do not understand the great clues it gives you, both in terms of problem-solving and of creative expression. Many quite valid reincarnational memories come as imaginings, but you do not trust them. A good percentage of your problems can be worked out rather easily through the use of your imagination. Often, you inadvertently use it to prolong quote-unquote negative circumstances, as you think of all the things that you could do wrong. Yet you can employ it very constructively, altering past, present, and future. To do so in your present, freely imagine a situation in which you are happy. To begin with your imaginings may seem foolish. If you are elderly, poor, and lonely, it may seem highly ludicrous to think of yourself as twenty, wealthy, and surrounded by friends and admirers. Indeed, if after such an enjoyable exercise you look about you and compare what you have envisioned with what you have, then you may feel worse than you did before. You are to realize that this imaginative world does exist, but not in the world of facts that you know. To some extent, however, according to your freedom within it, such an exercise will automatically rejuvenate your body, mind, and spirit, and begin to draw to you whatever equivalent is possible for you within the world of facts that you know. Using age as an example now, it may seem to you that you are a given age, that within your subjective experience it must be paramount, that regardless of your age you are to some extent closed off from the experience of being any other age. In some simultaneous existences you are very young, however, and in others very old. Some of your physical cells are brand new, so to speak. The regeneration of fresh life is physically within you. In your terms this is true not only until your death but even after it, when your hair and nails can still grow. 
Identify, then, with the constantly new energy alive within you, in this now of your being, and realize that on all levels you are biologically and psychologically connected with that greater identity that is your own. Now, no matter what your current situation, the answers lie within your own aspirations and abilities. Often you will hold down or inhibit certain aspects of your experience in order to use others. Using those available will automatically free you from inhibitions in other areas. There may be physical circumstances involving birth defects that are beyond alteration, where experience must be focused along other than usual pathways. Yet even here, those talents and characteristics that are available will open up vistas of experience and achievement. When you are utilizing your imagination in the way that I have suggested, purposefully do so in a playful manner, knowing that in so-called realistic terms there may be great discrepancies between imagination and fact. In your reality, take that for granted. Yet often, your freewheeling, quote-unquote, silly, seemingly unrealistic imagination will bring you quite practical solutions to your problems, for if the exercise is done properly, you will be automatically releasing yourself from restrictions that you have taken for granted. Even if a direct solution does not appear, rejuvenation will of itself begin to point you in the proper direction. If you are a woman in an unhappy marriage, for example, you may begin by imagining yourself with a fine suitor. Now, no Sir Galahad may appear, but if the exercise is pursued properly, you will automatically begin to feel loved, and therefore worthy of love, and lovable, where before you felt rejected, unworthy, and inferior. This feeling of being loved will alter your reality, drawing love to you. You will act loved. Your spouse may then find you exhibiting characteristics of a most pleasant nature, and he himself may change. On the other hand, you may draw another man to you, and end the marriage that has served its purposes in all ways, finding now the impetus and the reasons for change. Because your imagination transcends time, it is one of your greatest touchstones to your own identity. You must, of course, be able to distinguish between the world of imagination and the physical world of fact in order to be able to manipulate effectively. But physical reality springs from the imagination, which follows the path of your beliefs. In the exercise just given, you use the belief in effective change in any given area, and then allow your imagination freedom along those directed lines. Such an exercise automatically does even more, opening up the window of perception and letting in the knowledge and experience of other portions of the self. As the light and energy flows through, it will be tinted or colored by your own psychological reality, as the rays of the sun are through colored glass. This simply means that the other dimensional information will often appear in ordinary guise, through an intuitive hunch, a sudden idea, or some solution that has already occurred to you but has not been acted upon. Your cells' multidimensional knowledge is usually not consciously available, nor can they put it into psychological terms for you. Such work with the imagination acts as a trigger, however, drawing information to you from other levels of your greater reality and concentrating it on the specific problem at hand. It will then appear in terms understandable to your own experience. In itself, such an exercise creatively alters probabilities, for you no longer live with the problem as an unchanging concrete reality. This is a psychological and psychic impetus, altering the messages that you habitually send to your body and to its cellular construction. You are then creatively manipulating in several layers of experience. Take, for example, the two instances just given. The older person imagining youth will, during such an exercise, reactivate certain hormonal and chemical changes, becoming younger. And the woman who feels rejected does the same thing when imagining herself loved. Such practice also activates within the self all of its unconscious but quite valid experiences, drawing out similar episodes on the part of other simultaneous lives. In one existence, the old person is young. The unloved woman is indeed beloved. These unconscious realities become turned on through the use of the imagination. Each day is a window into each life. End of chapter.